what these programs bring to you is a very uh, full but abbreviated version of a several hour long program in which we get into a lot of fire behavior, a lot of things that expand your knowledge base in this conference setting. We kind of get to you what you need to operate, recognize, and see what's going on in a potential flashover situation. And what we're going to kind of refer to that today is a ventilation limited environment, and we'll talk more about that. If this was a, a three beakers of stuff, and this was heat, this was fuel, and this was oxygen, we have to mix those together in the right quantity to make fire happen. If we remove one of those, fire goes out, in theory. If we have a fire burning in a confined structure in a building, and there's no holes in the window top side or anything else, then we open the front door and allow what to enter? Air, okay, it's not pure oxygen, it's air, okay? We let the air come in, we shouldn't be extremely surprised that it's going to light. And if the conditions are right in there, the fuel mixtures are right, the oxygen mixture is right, the heat is right, it's going to light very quickly. Light very quickly, which in turn brings us to this flashover thing. All right? We're going to talk about the goals of flashover training. We're going to talk about why a flashover happens. What are you looking for to see that phenomenon starting to occur? You're on a hose line, you're on breathing air, and you're 25 or 30 feet in a building, and you see those four warning signs, I would offer to you that you're one radio click away from a mayday, unless you do something immediately. Okay? So the four warning signs are an action item for a hose team inside of a burning building to say, we need to do something right now. We are going to give you the tools to slow it down. So you see this thing going on, we're going to teach you how to put a pattern of water on this thing that will rapidly cool the gases, flip that thing around, cool the walls and the surfaces in there to absorb some more heat, and the only thing it's going to do is what? Slow it down and stop it for a minute, and at that point in time, you as a hose crew or anybody that's in that building needs to withdraw. Quite frankly, at that point in time, if you're on a rescue mission, um, the likelihood of anybody surviving a flashover including people in full protected clothing and breathing apparatus is very low. So the occupant profile just tanked. Okay, it's, it's, there's nothing left to rescue other than you. So forewarning signs of a flashover, you crawl in the building, duck walking in, all of a sudden you're getting forced to the floor is the indication of what? It's getting hotter. Okay? As the fire that's burning in the building starts using up the air in the building, it's going to produce more what? Smoke. <clears throat> so inefficient burning means more ick, if you will, more smoke, okay, more products of combustion. So high heat, and that could be very quickly. Heavy, dark smoke because we're burning very inefficiently. We have an oxygen-sufficient atmosphere, so we still have a free-burning fire. That's number three. So high heat, heavy, dark smoke, and a free-burning fire because we have an oxygen-sufficient atmosphere that's still propagating heat, still getting hotter. We haven't put water on the seat of the fire. We haven't rounded the corner to the bedroom, all those things. And the last one is rollover. Somebody tell me what rollover is. Go ahead. I guess it would be like seeing flames roll through the top layer of the smoke, kind of like fingering. Okay. All right. I like that. So the rollover that we deal with in a well-ventilated building is the stuff that's cruising along the ceiling, right? And how are you taught to take care of that? Uh, penciling. penciling, straight stream, shooting it back, rounding the corner, right out of its essentials. It says you control rollover by putting the fire out. Okay, true story. You put the fire out. It's a strange thing. If you put the fire out, all your problems start to diminish. What we're looking for is a rollover, but however that rollover is just what you said a minute ago. It's kind of fingering itself and kind of running through the lower end of the smoke. So if I got an eight-foot ceiling and I've got fire down here in the smoke two or three feet off the floor, that's what we're looking for. It's not rolling along the ceiling. It's not deflected flame from the fire burning up and hitting the ceiling. This is actually the products of combustion, the primary one in smoke being carbon monoxide kind of whiffing through the column of smoke, at the even at the bottom of it, at the bottom of the thermal layer. So that's kind of a big problem for us. And in 
the ignition temperature of that stuff, depending on what book you read, and I apologize for Fahrenheit and Celsius, so I'm going to talk in Fahrenheit, is uh, 1,000 to 1,200 degrees. And so what you see is this stuff starting to light up, so it kind of comes and goes, comes and goes. That's telling you that two or three feet off the floor, you now have temperatures that you would expect at ceiling height. Okay? And so it is very close to just lighting that whole fuel package up, which is what? The smoke that has gone from up here down to here because we've got a lot of fire, we've got a lot of air being used, it's burning very inefficiently, a lot of smoke's being propagated in there. So rapid development of heat, heavy dark smoke, an uncontrolled free burning fire, and the rollover things happening in that thermal layer are your four warning signs. The techniques that we're going to give you are totally out of what you would normally do. So if I told you right now that we're going to open a fog nozzle up and spray the gas and spray the smoke, would you look at me like I'm crazy? Most people would. Most people do, quite honestly. Um, so again, we're, we have to step back for a minute. We have conditions to say we need to do something right now. So right out of Vince Dunn 101, right out of Fire Behavior 101, we need to rapidly cool that gas off. And how do we cool things off quickly? Fine and divided particles of fog or water that will expand very quickly and absorb a bunch of heat. Remember, this is a life-saving action for us. And obviously, the primary goal is to save us from getting hurt. Okay? We don't want to get hurt. We don't want to get anybody hurt. Especially, don't want to get anybody hurt for something that we were not able to save anyway. All right? Our exposure to this phenomenon called flashover has certainly increased uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones is our protective clothing. Uh, back in the day, and I'm going to go back 30 years, and uh, I can tell you for sure our protective clothing in those day and age wouldn't allow us to even be in those kinds of temperatures at all. Polycarbonate helmets, canvas or Nomex, I'm going back into the 80s. In 1970s and 1980s, when we first had the notion of going inside burning buildings to do stuff, we weren't getting hung up in flashovers because we couldn't be in there much more than 120 or 30 degrees because we, our protective clothing was designed to do it. Okay, So now, here we are, fast forward 30 some odd years, and we have protective clothing where we have helmets that will withstand three or 400 degrees of heat before they melt. Lexan shields that have you know, temperature ratings in 350 to 400 degrees, so now we're talking floor level. We have our protective clothing under the new NFPA standard. It'll take a couple thousand degrees for 20 seconds. So I would offer you this. If you're in a burning building and you're on the floor and you are getting absolutely uncomfortably hot, your Lexan shield starts to discolor in front of you, you're in trouble. You, you're just absolutely in trouble. We need to have really well-trained fire officers that are backing up a nozzle person. I would say probably one of the most dangerous fire officers is a fire officer on a nozzle. You know, we've got fire people to do that. Firefighters should be doing that kind of stuff. That company officer needs to be looking around, having a thermal imaging camera, taking a look at things. What's the temperature signature? What's the heat signature down the hall? What is the heat signature at the ceiling? Looking for ways to get out. Other hazards, taking a look. What's going on? It's not just looking at fire and watching it roll across. There's a lot of things going on. We should be very well acquainted with the thermal imaging camera that can find people. We should be very f familiar with, and if you haven't trained this stuff, when's the last time you looked at a thermal imager looking for a hose line, or looking for a breathing apparatus bottle, or looking for a hand tool carried in by a missing firefighter? That's thermal imager training, and that's what that company officer should be doing, along with monitoring conditions in that building, even when we're fighting fires. Is it cooling off? Did we spray water? Did it work, or did it not work? We're looking at the ceiling and it appears to be fire above us. That's a problem. So here's kind of a pretty good definition. It's an old definition, but it's probably one of the best around. Vince Dunn is a, a deputy chief down in New York City and uh, hanging around down there for 40 some odd years and probably seen more fire collectively than Northern Ontario has seen in a lifetime. He kind of broke it down in firefighter language and the scientific definition, firefighter scientific, of a definition of flasher of states, it's caused by radiation feedback of heat. So we're talking about heat, and we're just going into the basic mushrooming thing, it goes up and out and down, we all know that, thermal layering, 
But as it's doing that, these walls are getting hot too. So sheetrock is great. It's a high moisture construction material, a lot of water and gypsum, so it can be used for firewalls, great paintable surface, but it takes a little while for fire to penetrate that. But at some point in time, it's not going to be able to hold up anymore, so it's just going to start dumping the heat back into the room. Okay? So it's re-radiating back into the room. Well, in this room, we've got a smoke column from ceiling to four feet down off the floor. What is that? That's our fuel. That's gas, right? It's carbon monoxide, carbon products of combustion, and it's ignitable at 1,000 degrees. So now we've got the fire propagating, putting out heat through pressurized smoke, and now the walls are starting to re-radiate back. Now we've got these tables starting to burn, so we've got this convected heat mass going through the building. You guys know what convection is? Movement of heated air, liquids, and gases. Okay, so it's moving, floating through, okay, and going out somewhere. It's pressurized, so it's going out. So when you see that heavy pressurized smoke coming out the front door, that's pressurized smoke. It's moving through convected heat. So now we're heating this stuff up. Remember, solids, liquids don't burn. What burns? Gases. So we're starting to decompose the table, decompose whatever in there, the carpet, the furnishings. It's starting to give off gas. Pretty soon it lights up, the gas lights up, and now we've got the re-radiated heat coming back into the gas. We've got fire burning down here that's heating it up. The stage is set. Heat from the growing fire is absorbed in the upper walls and contents of the room, heating up the combustible gaseous furnishings to their auto-ignition temperature or just their ignition temperature. This buildup of heat in the room triggers a flashover. We've got all this going on, so what we're talking about is once you start seeing the little fingers of flame running through the smoke, not at the ceiling, we can't see the ceiling anymore probably if we're in that condition, is okay, high heat, heavy dark smoke, free burning fire, and I got these fingers, flip, we're going to a fog nozzle, squirt that combustible gases, rapidly cooling them off with fine divided particle, finely divided particles of water, which turn into steam absorbing the heat. We go to a straight stream, cool the walls, cool the walls, cool the ceiling, allowing them to absorb some more heat, albeit very briefly, and we leave. That's it. All right, so there's those pesky warning signs again. I'm going to ask you out there when you're up in front uh, with us today, we're going to ask you if you see them. You'll see them develop. We're going to bring you in there. We're going to light the fire from the very beginning, let it burn, let it build up. So you're going to get some fire behavior stuff. We're going to talk about changing the ventilation profile in there. We're going to have the doors wide open. There's a vent top side that's going to be open. We're going to let the fire free burn. We're going to have deflected flame. We're going to have rollover, just kind of run along the ceiling. We're going to get some smoke. We're going to get some heat in there. We're going to change the ventilation profile. We're going to shut the top side vent. We're going to shut the door. And you're going to just see that thermal airing just crash down very quickly. A lot of thermodynamics changing in there. You're going to see the bottom of that thermal layering, okay? And you're going to see smoke getting pulled back in. So if we're using air inside the flashover train or inside the building, Mother Nature is going to try and fix that. So she's going to start sending air into that low pressure area. And so really great training for a fire person. If you come to a door and, you know, you do your nice good door check and everything, you open up, look inside, and all of a sudden you see this air get pulled in, the smoke pulled back, Probably ought to be going to that environment with a charged hose line because there's something going on in there where you're going up the stairs and smoke's getting drug up the stairs and around the corner to the left. It's kind of just leading you down the, down the path. Things you're going to change or make it happen sooner or later is this list of variables up there, the room size. A bedroom that's maybe 12 feet by 12 feet, 14 by 14, whatever, is going to flash over a lot quicker than this room. Okay. Openings in the room, that has to do with ventilation in as well as ventilation out. Heat release, what are we talking about with heat release? I think you call them calories up here, BTUs, British thermal units, how much heat is being released, what's burning, what's in this furniture that's making it put off black smoke. So we've got very well insulated homes these days with you know, triple pane windows and you know, R whatever in the ceilings and walls. It's designed, huh? Spray foam, you name, and there's, there's a problem if it gets into that. Yeah, good point. Ceiling height, if we've got a big load of gas and a vaulted ceiling or a high ceiling like this, you know, and maybe the lower end of that neutral plane's down here, there's a lot of fuel up there. If it goes off, it's going to push you down and punish you. So don't get complacent with that. If you're walking in, you've got a 10 or 15 foot ceiling, and you're walking in at this height, it's still going to hurt you. All right? And then, of course, ventilation again. How much is there? Did we ventilate too early? Okay, 
we're really rethinking some of these things and we've had some studies going on down in the lower 48 out in New York area, uh, Governor's Island thing where we're rethinking vent inner search, we're rethinking if it's okay to put water in from the outside first before we go in. Uh, this notion of going from the unburned to the burned, we're kind of looking all that over and, and what we've been doing for a long, 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 extra long time may not be exactly the best thing to do. Traditional fire development curve. It's been around for a long time and basically it goes from here and it grows, we flash over and then as we start to use up all the fuel and we tip off the other side, it goes into decay. So the traditional curve is fuel limited fire growth and decay. We're gonna run, if we have a structure burning, all the windows are open, the door is open, there's a whole top side and it's just going. It's got plenty of air, but it's not gonna burn forever. It's gonna gradually run out of fuel. Or it could lead to a backdraft if everything's kind of caked up and closed up and really tight. But as we start over here at ignition, we go through the growth phase, just before it curves out to the top, we get into that flashover area. Fuel limited, oxygen sufficient, we use it all up and it crashes down on the other side. Fire is not limited by lack of oxygen. As more fuel becomes involved, it gets hot. We're way up here on the, on the scale. It's hot, a lot of, lot of energy is being released. It's going to use it all up. Fully developed, as it burns away, the energy level drops because we're running out of fuel and we can start to hit the bottom of the other side of the curve. So here is that curve. This has been around for a long time. And so we get over here, there's ignition. We get up here into the growth, right up here is flashover. It's fully developed now. We just burn, 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 burn. We run out of fuel, but we don't run out of oxygen or air. And it drops off the other side or we're completely closed up in a building and it starts to decay on the other side. So a fire starts in a structure fire with the doors all closed, okay? And it burns and it's gonna use up air and gradually it's going to start to diminish its energy. And there's still adequate oxygen. So this is just the setup for a flashover. Adequate oxygen to allow for combustion, so it's still burning, although the burning is going to be a little bit depressed because it's running low on air. Okay, so we get down to that 16, 17 range where it's, <clears throat> excuse me, still burning, but and still putting off gas, but still keeping the heat level up there where we can get an ignition. So we start to tip over into decay up here, and then the, we call that now and the kind of the new term that's emerging is a ventilation limited environment meaning we need some air. We're not out, we're not in backdraft, but we need some air. So here's the same curve, except we've got a little arrhythmia in it. So we started down here and we make a run, then over here about part way up, we start getting a little low on air. We tip that thing over and we start dropping off and then the fire department shows up. And then we, we add that air to that very hostile, hot, fuel rich environment, thinking we're gonna go do something and we do, we get it to light up. Just like we're gonna to do today, over and over and over in the flashover trainer, we're gonna open the vent top side, we're gonna to open the back door, and lo and behold, it's gonna to start to roll over and ultimately lead to a flashover unless we stop it, all right? So then we run rapidly back up the scale, we're super hot, and then we're back into that ventilation uh, sufficient fuel limited environment. Hopefully we put the fire out. So let's talk about that. So here's some contemporary fire ground thoughts for you. So if you pull up to a single family dwelling and you've got this ventilation limited atmosphere inside there and everybody's outside the house and they're telling you everybody's outside the house, do you have a rescue? No, you need to search. No, drag a hose line around to the window and squirt some water in the thing and cool the fire off. Because here's what we found in our research down in, in, uh, in New York. And we've had this thing, you know, you squirt water from the outside, it's gonna interrupt thermal layering and do all these bad things inside of a house. Well, they actually got NIST involved, uh, National Institute of Safety Technology and Underwriters Lab UL, and they put cameras inside all these buildings and put temperature monitors up and down and applied properly from the outside. What they learned was that it actually dropped the temperature remarkably even to the point where somebody was trapped in there may have a chance to survive if they're in a different part of the house, and it did not interrupt visibility in the house. If we have an opportunity in there, we'll do an atmosphere test. That's kind of putting a wide fog up into the neutral plane, and then using aggressive cooling in conjunction with penciling. We're gonna fog fog, cool those gases with rapidly expanding 
droplets of water to absorb a bunch of heat. Straight stream, hit the surfaces, allowing for some more absorption. That's it. Recognize them, do something about them, and withdraw. A firefighter can travel two and a half feet a second without a hose line, and you have just a couple seconds to get out of a building. So for me to that table right there, what they're suggesting is if you see those four warning signs, you should probably do something, all right? I think that I can probably make that leap if things were bad. Here's the deal. What is the key word there? Without a hose line. If you're removing a hose line, you're moving just a little bit slower. However, the upside of that is I have a hose line. Again, nozzle techniques to delay a flashover, it's only designed to give you some time to get out. This is not an evolution that is going to allow you to go farther. Um, I've seen that in places where I've gone to teach, where they've gone, gone back to do refresher training, and they've taught it to go farther and deeper into the building. If you have a condition where your life is threatened, it's five or 600 degrees right off the floor level, I can tell you for sure that there's probably not going to be a survivor in that building other than you. And you have a chance to do something and get out. Cool it and leave. Doesn't mean we're going to burn the building down. Doesn't mean we're going to just let it go and call it good. We may go outside and do what we probably should have done anyway, and squirt a bunch of water in from the windows, cool it off, and go back in and do something with it. But at that time, you know, there's a lot of other things that are not, aren't necessarily part of this class come into play. What is the building profile? Do we have structural members that have been compromised as it snuck into the attic and you've got a trust roof that it's, or trust, trust structures up there that it's starting to compromise? What is happening at that point in time? How long has that fire been burning? How long has that fire been burning? You know, by the time you get the call at the fire department and you jump out of your houses and you drive to the fire station and get a fire engine and go to the call, it's probably been burning for half an hour. Okay, so in an actual fire, you'll be on the same level as the burn room. So when we're out there, we're working down here low, where we've got about a three-foot bench in front of us. And I'll keep reminding you that if this was really happening, this is where you'd be. And so when we have a thermal layer that's down to 18 inches off the floor, with fingers running through 18 inches off the floor, keep in mind this is where you would be. That would be very, very uncomfortable at best. When we're out there and in the, in the box, in the simulator, a lot of radiant heat, a lot of convected heat. If, if you're to start touching protective clothing with hands, you're going to have somebody's handprint on you. When you're putting on your breathing apparatus, the Drager gang out there, make sure you're putting those on right. This will be one where you don't want to tighten up your shoulder straps until they're pinching on your shoulders. You'll get the little burns. We want to stay low. Um, there's going to be some draft curtains in the back. If you, if you fail to remember to stay low and you stand up and walk out, that'll remind you to stay low. But we want to stay low in there. We're going to have at helmet height in there, we're going to be probably 400 degrees roughly. A little bit higher, 600. It's going to be pretty warm inside there. I'll just leave it at that. Short bursts. We're going to use just very minimal water in there. We don't want to put the fire out. We don't want to create a big steam thing. We want to run the evolution. We want to see how it works. We're going to just put small bursts on there. To be quite frank with you, in the simulator, we could take this much water, take the lid off this, and just spray it up there, and, and it'll knock it down. Trusty safety officer will be checking everybody that goes in, so we want to make sure you're safe. Self-check, we'll check, come inside, and we'll do a briefing inside the box so you know where the doors are, what's going to kind of happen, what it looks like, what you can expect in there. Once we do the briefing, we'll do a little bit of nozzle training. I think you're going to see this in every presentation you go to. We're going to have fun out there. I like to have fun when I train, but we got to, we got to have fun smart, so no horse, no horse playing around, no messing with people's stuff. Pay attention to us. Have some fun. You're going to see some stuff you just don't get to see and live through it. You want to look at it that way? You guys are going to see a flashover. You will be able to reach above your head, and there will be a, a five or 600-degree flame floating by your visor. Thank you very much.